Is there any greater feeling in life than being with someone with whom we share deep love? Think about it. I mean, there are many experiences that we have of great joy, success. I hope that all of us have them. But isn't there something unique about just being with a loved one? Certainly, hopefully, spouses know this for many years, all of us with maybe close friends or with siblings or parents or children. There's this, just this indescribable joy and comfort just with being with someone whom we love and who loves us. And I think the experience is common to us because it is part of our makeup. One of the most basic teachings of our faith about the human person is that we are made in the image and likeness of God. And last Sunday we reflected upon who God is as that most blessed trinity. Three persons but one God united in perfect, infinite, and unchanging love. It makes sense then that if we are made in His image, then we too long for and will be perfectly fulfilled when we know something of that love and unity. This Sunday, we gather on the feast of the most holy body and blood of Christ, and it calls us to reflect upon this gift of the Holy Eucharist and how this most blessed sacrament seeks to fulfill in us union with God. This sacrament is truly and really the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. You know, we could just stop here and our mind could not fully comprehend the depth of this mystery. Our gospel today takes us to that last supper, to that upper room when Jesus celebrated that last Passover meal with his apostles before he would act to bring about our salvation. This meal that remembers the deliverance of the chosen people from the slavery of Egypt to the freedom of the promised land. And now he fulfills this Passover and he sacramentally anticipates what is about to occur the next day, how in his passion and death, all of humanity is offered deliverance from the slavery of sin. And so in this sacred meal, Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. We are called to open our minds and hearts to the magnificence of this reality that we gather and celebrate every weekend. The Catechism gives three sentences, and so I just want to read these to you. So the church teaches, the sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. Here, Christ offers through the ministry of priests who then offered himself on the cross. Only the manner of offering is different. For in the Mass, the same Christ who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the cross is contained and offered in an unbloody manner. <laughs> Aren't we overwhelmed when we stop and think about this? Isn't this almost too much for our minds to grasp? And yet there is a second aspect of this mystery that we must also contemplate, and that is what our experience in the Eucharist is meant to accomplish in us. In our first reading from the book of Exodus, we hear Moses proclaiming this covenant that God established with his people. In our second reading from the letter of the Hebrews, the sacred writer wants his readers and all of us to see how the blood of Christ that it was shed for us now establishes a new covenant in the forgiveness of our sins and this promise of union with the living God, not only now, but then forever in heaven. One of the most beautiful reflections on the Holy Eucharist that I have ever read, and that I am certain I probably will ever read, was the last encyclical written by Pope St. John Paul II. He wrote it on Holy Thursday in the year 2003. It was entitled Ecclesia de Eucharistia, on the Eucharist and its relationship with the church. And I know I've spoken of this before. I've, I've given Lent reflections on it a couple years ago here. 
but I urge all of you to take the time to read this someday. I urge you then to do as I try to do every couple years or so, to reread it. It is a brilliant and mystical reflection undertaken by one of the greatest men of the 20th century, this prophet, this great pope who served as the vicar of Christ for nearly 27 years and whose papacy in so many ways arguably has no equal in the church's history. He writes this. The church is called during her earthly pilgrimage to maintain and promote communion with the triune God and communion among the faithful. For this purpose, she possesses the word and the sacraments, particularly the Eucharist, by which she constantly lives and grows and in which she expresses her very nature. <laughs> it is not by chance that the term communion has been one of the names given to this sublime sacrament for it is the culmination of all the sacraments in, perfect, in perfecting our communion with God the Father by identification with his only begotten Son through the working of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> wow. Our culture and our world is so divided and fractured. The growing secularism in our nation denies the truth of Jesus as a son of God and his continued presence in the life of the church. So many voices exalt diversity, whatever the heck that means. And we have lost the understanding that it's only in the order and plan of God that humanity can achieve its true identity and achieve its potential and that is of unity, of communion with God and in Him with one another. And so our celebration of the Holy Eucharist seeks to oppose this division and this disunity so that Christ, in and through the church, can express and accomplish for us what the church is called to be, the universal sacrament of unity for the world Again, the Catechism put it this way, the Eucharist makes the church. Those who receive the Eucharist are united more closely to Christ. Through it, Christ unites them to all the faithful in one body, the church. <laughs> Is there a more wonderful experience than to be with someone with whom you share great love? Here, the someone is not a human person, but our infinitely loving God. Here, he wishes to fill us with all the grace that we need to grow in our love of him and then through him in our love of one another. Here, he wishes to effect a union with him that will satisfy every human heart. Pope St. John Paul II explained his motivation in writing that last encyclical about two years before he would die. He said that his hope was to rekindle what he called a Eucharistic amazement and spoke of the cosmic character of our celebration of Holy Mass. For the Eucharist, he wrote, unites heaven and earth. May we grow in that amazement. May we grow in our realization of the cosmic reality of what it is that occurs here. And may we grow united in faith and in love in the very joy and life of him whose most body and blood we will soon receive.